So this is Nalini Elkins with Industry Network Technology Council. And uh, we are starting our webinar series up again with the, the uh, IoT. And we had a wonderful presentation last time uh, from uh, Karsten. And we are continuing now with uh, Pascal, who will tell us a, a great deal more uh, about uh, uh, quite a few things. He, he has uh, written uh, so many of the RFCs in this area of IoT. So that'll be just a, a great um, uh, resource for us. Um, uh, as we said before, this is a multi-year project uh, for doing IPv6 deployment at enterprises. The reason that we are concentrating this time on IoT is that um, IoT and the scale of how many IoT devices will be on our networks is, um, uh, I suspect, will be a great reason for people to go to uh, towards IPv6, and that is why uh, we are focusing on IoT in such great detail right now. Um, these webinars are made possible from a grant from ISIF Asia to our sister organization, IIESOC in India. Uh, INTC and IIESOC are both um, uh, nonprofits. Uh, and we work together on this uh, webinar series. Thank you so much, ISIF Asia. Uh, if you are interested in deployment grants, uh, you and you are in the um, uh, APNIC uh, region, uh, please uh, apply uh, for their grants, and uh, they will help you uh, uh, with uh, IPv6 deployment and uh, rollout. So, so do please go up there if you're interested. Uh, just a, a few words about me. I'm the president of Industry Network Technology Council. I, I also have a for-profit. I've been working with uh, IPv6 for many years and with enterprises for uh, many more years. Um, so let's say a couple of words about Pascal. Pascal is principal engineer at Cisco. And as you can see here, he has been the, the co-editor of many, many of the, uh, the, the, the drafts that we really need to have uh, to make um, uh, IoT work um, uh, in, in, in this new environment, and in particular with, uh, with IPv6. He has over 300 patents. Um, and uh, on that, I'm going to turn it over to Pascal to go ahead and run uh, the webinar. And thank you so much uh, for speaking, Pascal. So if you would go ahead and show your screen, we can get started. OK, Nandi. Um, I'm trying to share. I don't know if you're getting it. Um, it's supposed to go full yeah. screen now. Yeah, no, okay. we don't get it. No, we're not seeing it. If we, if you have problems, otherwise I'll just go ahead and shall I just go ahead and and run? I can just run your presentation. Oh no no oh, oh. there we go Pascal perfect perfect. Oh, okay, it might be that uh, I don't have that much bandwidth in the room. I mean, okay. So I um I will just uh, share my video for a sec just to say hi and then I will turn off the video because. Well, it doesn't even seem to be coming. I, I, I probably have a bad with Prime. So, so let's let's get started. Yeah, thank um, you. <clears throat> so, uh, as Nalini said, we uh, this this webinar is part of the IoT track. It's the second webinar in a series of, of five, given by a number of bright people and great contributors to the IoT community at the IETF. And um, so if, if you look at the program, so the, the first uh, webinar happened on uh, April 20, 28th. If you missed it, it, it was recorded. So I guess uh, you will be able to, to join it later. So this is the second uh, dedicated to 6 net and row, basically deterministic wireless at the IETF. Um, then um, on May 26, there will be um, a session dedicated to how we do IPv6 on low power network, not ultra low power, there is also LP1, but for low power networks. So that will be all the discussion of what happened at 6 Lopan. Then on June 9, we will have um, 
repo, the routing protocol for low power LC networks and its evolution. And finally, on June 5, uh, there will be a session on 6 lop ND and repo, which uh, I will probably be giving. And with this, let me give you a little bit of context uh, about the work that we are doing. So when I started to, to work at Cisco, that was in the 1990s, um, there were a number of dedicated networks for a number of dedicated activity. For instance, mail was going through paper and uh, you have to write it down, you have to send it. And um, there were a number of subnets on the way from the source to the destination. And those subnets could be very slow, like Pony Express, or they could be very lossy, like the Titanic. Um, for, for when I was uh, visiting the US, I wanted to call my wife because it was another dedicated network. Um, the price for international was, was very high. Um, if I wanted to watch TV, and actually I did, I would bring my American VCR uh, for the NTSC standard, uh, record Star Trek and bring it back to France. What I'm getting at is uh, there were a number of dedicated networks and that caused a lot of complexity, that caused uh, latency difficulties, and that caused a huge OPEX for, for the network providers, meaning that the, this, this OPEX cost was repercuted on the customer, that was me, and so I had to pay huge money, uh, huge money for any of the services and the, the quantity available were, were limited. Um, what happened since is, is the internet and the convergence of all the standards about the internet. And the benefits of doing this were huge, right? Most of the services that I was talking about became free. Uh, data network could scale to the, to the internet size. But most of all, um, beyond what could be obtained as service with the legacy mechanism, the, the convergence of all the services over the internet enabled new and unexpected value. For instance, email, I can, in minutes, I can archive, I can dig my archive uh, for finding any given email that I wrote years ago uh, with Skype and, and WebEx and, and uh, all those conference systems. We can basically dialogue online, not just watch TV, and TV uh, is now much cheaper and it can be on demand. I can load my uh, movies and watch them anytime on any device. And all this basically is the consequence of the convergence of this legacy network onto the internet. But there is a domain which will broadly refer to as OT for operational network that never really converged onto IP. And this operational type of network includes um, audio, pro audio, video, for instance, the concerts, if you've been to a concert, you might have seen trucks unloading literally tons of cables, these big fat black table cables. Uh, they have to deploy to transport the, the, the sound in an analog fashion. Um, the the um, smart grid, the, well, the grid itself, um, the, you need to, to trip uh, um, uh, cutter basically in half of, of the sign of, of your uh, current uh, if the, the cable is the, the transport is broken and that means that you have a very strict requirement on your network and, and people won't trust IP for doing that uh, in your car you also have a dedicated network like canvas which is effectively uh, very reliable and will deliver the commands when you press the brake immediately with a guaranteed latency which our IP network cannot do and so on and so on. And, and obviously the, the, the elephant in the room is industry 4.0 and all the, the requirements for industrial protocols. There are tons of industrial protocols providing highly reliable communication for the industrial needs. And then again, those guys will not trust IP. And the reason why they won't trust IP is that uh, the, the, the main design of IP is stochastic. It's, it's designed for best effort with greater service, but still best effort uh, statistical multiplexing. And this is the last thing that those guys want. Uh, an automation network started with uh, um, current uh, modulation between 4 and 20 milliamps. Each time you had something to measure, you would modulate the, the current. And that was instantaneous when at the speed of light and, and you could take an action immediately. Then we, we, we told them, hey, you can go digital and there is value for that. As soon as you go digital to, to send a digital digital signal over the, the wire, it already takes the time to send one bit and then another bit, several bits in a series, which already introduced some latency. 
but that was okay because now you could you could uh, send more value over your wire like configuration information etc which you could not do uh, by just modulating current and then they said well let's have more than one device on this wire fine and that's when we started incorporating what we call a bus and the bus is still a serial cable but it is multi-drop meaning that there will be different sources and destination over the same cable and to achieve this what you're going to do is you're going to time division multiplex who can speak on that cable and then you will have a round robin each one in turn can speak this added to the original latency of serializing the bit because now you have to to wait for your turn but at least the latency that was incurred uh, was bounded. You knew, you knew that you had to wait for the round, next round of chance to speak, but there was a maximum delay for that, and then you could speak. And that was acceptable as long as the, the rotation of your TDM was fast enough, that was acceptable for the OT operation. What was not acceptable for a number of critical operations was the pure Ethernet slash IP stochastic behavior, where anybody can speak and then queues will form and latency will vary, and possibly there will be congestion loss. I mean, that was beyond the capability of those network, uh, of those applications to, to, to live with. So the only way to effectively converge the OT networks uh, which include I, small IoT devices, but also huge robots and, and carts at Disneyland and control for uh, nuclear plants, etc. The, the only way to converge those networks will be to actually improve the capability uh, of IP network. And that is, that is the core of what we call deterministic networks. And that's what uh, I will be talking to you uh, about. Basically, if you, you, you think about uh, driving a car, you take a new car, and yes, the, the steering wheel is a bit different. The, uh, the pressure you need to press, the brakes, uh, will be different with these new cars, but you will get used to it. That's because you're human. But when you have machine to machine, small machine, big machines, whatever, when you have machine to machine, the machines will never get used to. The network has to provide exactly the right service at the right time. And this is what we want to break with deterministic networks on, on IP. And that's what will enable machine-to-machine -machine communication for critical flows. And that's basically what we call deterministic. So deterministic has an, a number of definitions. You find them in mathematics, for instance, in some kind of perfections, completely guaranteed. You also have a, a definition in philosophy, but there is a bottom line. And the bottom line is, I know what traffic I have. So for a very well-known traffic shape that will enter my network. I know I will control when that traffic is forwarded along my network, and I can reproduce the same service for every packet, every time, guaranteed. So, and that will be completely independent on uh, whether my network is loaded or whether this flow is the only one on my network. To explain better what we mean by uh, the determinism, I will take a, a number of uh, examples of analogies. And the first analogy I built for you is um, this, the, the bus analogy. So you've got buses in your city. And you, you know that, say, um, you have a bus uh, every 15 minutes that, you know, uh, uh, do, do, at your door, near your door uh, steps. Um, and that bus line will take 30 minutes to reach your, your office. So you know deterministically that there is a bounded latency between home and the office, which is 30 plus 15, 45 minutes. Whatever happens whenever you leave home, uh, you know that uh, at most 45 minutes later, it could be 31 if you're lucky, it could be 45, 44 uh, if you're unlucky, but um, you know that definitely 45 minutes later, it will be at the office. So if you leave before 8, 8.15, you know that at 9, you're at the office. Every day, guaranteed. And the reason why <clears throat> the buses can guarantee that to you is because the buses will have a, a dedicated lane on which there will, no be, there will not be an obstacle, on which there will not be a car that will slow them down. And uh, so they will effectively um, transport you in 30 minutes, whatever. Um, in a deterministic network, the, the equivalent of that would be, for instance, if you have a plane and you have the pilot who, who, who presses a button or does any action, and you want the network in the plane to guarantee that within a certain latency, the command that the pilot has imprinted will be actuated by the plane. For instance, it will go up, go down, the engines will throttle, etc. anything. You want to guarantee that uh, the, the, this action will be taken by the plane. 
And um, the way it happens is effectively that there is a logical equivalent of this bus going through through your network every 15 minutes. So it's a lot less. It could be 100 milliseconds. But every 100 milliseconds, there is an opportunity, a bus, for the, the pilot to take it, his action, for you to jump in the bus. And if rarely, but when that happens, the pilot does something effectively, the equivalent of the 30 minutes later, the, the, the action will be taken by the plan, guaranteed. So that's, that's one aspect of a deterministic network, being able to say, hey, guaranteed at, uh, at this latency, your packet will reach the destination. Sometimes there can be jitter, those 15 minutes we talked about. Sometimes there's no jitter. It depends on how you shape and inject the traffic. But at least you have a guarantee of a bounded latency. And more than that, I mean, you could have more than one bus. Maybe you have to switch bus in the middle of your way to work. And that's that's still the same system. In a deterministic network, you can have multiple hubs. And, and maybe you will wait 15 more minutes for the second bus and 20 more minutes to reach the office. But still, the sum of those will be a bounded, guarantee, a, a, a bounded latency, which is guaranteed every day, every day. And with this, what we intend to do is eliminate the statistical effect uh, of, uh, of the IP stochastic best effort uh, statistical multiplex basically we want to avoid the statistical effect and provide this guarantee that those uh, operational applications uh, care about now let me let me give you a a second analogy and this time it's going to be the train station so what you have here which looks weird it's actually uh, the schedule map of a number of trains between the uh, very old map actually uh, city of paris to the city of Lyon two cities in France. And you see uh, on the top line that some trains start and, and you can follow basically each uh, station that will go through at which time. And I have an, uh, enlarged a little zone. And if you look at this little zone, you will see that there is this blue train and there is another train which actually crosses. And what, what is completely unallowed, what can never happen on, on the train station is collision loss, right? You don't want two trains going out the same station at the same time. That would be a very bad idea. So what, what happens at the station is one of the trains, in this case, the blue train, will wait for a certain time at the station on a certain garage lane until the faster train uh, can go through. So one thing you can see is there can be a very fast train which has very little weight on every station, but not all flows, not all trains can be very fast. For some trains to be able to go very, very fast and wait very little on the stations, to avoid collision collision loss, there will be other trains which will have to wait. And um, that's, that's the equivalent with deterministic networks. You, you can't expect that flows for which we provide deterministic guarantees will always be faster. Actually, for the most piece, they will be slower than hot potato. But what will always happen is the train starts at the right time and arrives at the right time. That's the guarantee you get. The guarantee you don't get is to be the fastest possible between A and B. And you won't because uh, only one train can exist uh, at the rest of the station at one point of time. So expect for most flows, but maybe one or two for which we, we prioritize and that go first, expect that most of the other flows will have to wait here, there, etc., to provide you the guarantees that you want and that the average, the, the overall latency in the network for a deterministic flow can be higher than for a non-deterministic. Now let me give you another analogy, a final one, which is the casino. And, and basically, uh, so the, the, playing at the casino is a statistical game. You, uh, you play, you have chances to win, chances to lose. In the same fashion, when you, you enqueue a hot potato packet in a switch, there is a chance that the outgoing port is free, and then the packet will really fly. I mean, the, the player will win. But there are always chances that there is already one packet in that queue. There are chances that there are already two packets in that queue. And yes, depending on the priority on the load, the chances can be higher or slower, but uh, you can never avoid that chances, meaning that the latency that the, the packets will incur in the in a normal network um, can, can be most of the time the best possible latency, but sometimes there will be weight and more and more weight, and there will be a long tail of a long tail of weight because there is still a chance there are more packets in this queue to the point that there is a chance that some packets will be dropped. And the one thing you don't want to see happen on a deterministic network is collision loss. 
So you, you don't want to lose, so you don't want the, 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 the queues to grow. Not only don't you want the queues to grow, but you want the processing for a deterministic packet to be the same, like I said, deterministic, the same every time, same experience. You want the experience of a deterministic packet to be the same regardless of the load of the rest of the network. So you can have only this deterministic flow on this link. You can have tons of other deterministic flows. Each individual deterministic flow, by when you observe it, you won't be able to see that the link is loaded or not. If you just observe this flow uh, when you receive it at the end, you won't be able to figure out if it crossed a, a loaded network or not loaded network because the experience of the packets was always, always the same. And if you can guarantee that, you can also load your network a lot more uh, with critical flows than if you were just doing classical course. And, and the best thing is once you've done that, you still have room for normal packets. So another critical aspect of deterministic networks is the capability to transport not only the guaranteed deterministic flows, but to fill the rest of the link with non-deterministic. So what we said so far, we want to provide some guarantees. Some guarantees have to do with latency and some guarantees have to do with reliability. And the applications in OT can vary, but one critical thing is safety. You sometimes, you know, lives are at stake. Uh, you, you, you have industrial processes where you can eat some stuff, you have to measure, you have to react rapidly. And some of those processes can be chaotic, meaning that it, if you don't keep controlling it, then, then you can have an explosion. And so to control the thing, you need to have something like a control loop, and, and that means a packet at a certain period, which can be very fast or very, or very slow. But that some of those, those control loop for motion detection can be below the millisecond. And you can't lose, you can lose one packet, you can always lose one packet, but losing, for instance, four packets in a row, because the system is chaotic, you can't tune it anymore, maybe you have this explosion. So you can never lose too many packets in a row. And to avoid that, that, you really, that really means that you have to survive the loss of any equipment. And to, to resist the loss of any equipment, what you need to do is send more than one copy of the packet, or at least send more than one copy of each individual bit. So uh, the, uh, the receiver, which is the nick on the left, in this picture will receive at least two, an average, maybe 2.5 copy of every given bit that was sent by the, the ingress on the right. And so, when we, we build the deterministic network architecture, we have to account for this redundancy. And, and so, as opposed to the traditional way of doing networks, which is A to B to C in a serial pattern between a source and destination along a path, what we draw for deterministic network is this more complex graph from ingress to egress, where actions such as replication and elimination can happen not only at the ingress and egress, but also inside the network. And now think about a complex network of IoT devices where there are tons of those objects and, and you have a global bandwidth to optimize and you realize that building all the paths like my blue arrow is quite complex. It's very hard to do in a purely uh, decentralized way, distributed way. So even if the, the DeathNet architecture and the row architecture, uh, the six dish, all those architecture we're talking about today, tolerate, I mean, can, can live with, a, a, a potential distributed fashion, in practice, they all expect that there is a central controller. Uh, it can be a CNC in 5G, it can be a PC at the ATF. We, we always expect that there is a central controller that will basically establish some form of overlay in the network for a particular deterministic flow, and that's my blue road. And basically, the, the, the packets that you send will kind of flood this this blue network this blue overlay that uh, i have drawn here um the the nodes from the perspective of the controller and the perspective of the node it doesn't really matter if if those operations are done by a layer two or a layer three for the most part pe people don't care in practice some operations can only be done by a layer two like precise timing like shaping which must happen in those nodes to just Guarantee that your flows get the treatment you want. And some of the uh, operations like replication and elimination can be done either at layer two or layer three. And that's at 60 and row, we will be working them at layer three actually. Um, and all this under the programming of the PC. So the PC will establish 
uh, the state in all those blue nodes. So they expect a certain packet with a certain marking saying, hey, this is uh, how this, the packets which are marked this way should, should be treated by the network. All the packets with the same marking will have the same treatment. So the, the marking will basically indicate the blue path on which the packet must be uh, copied in all those directions. And um, then since there is replication elimination, you will also need something to say, hey, it's a different copy of the same packet. So you can eliminate, for instance, in, in the, the blue node in the middle, or you can reorder at the, at the receiver end. So all this is basically a common architecture that you will find in, in TSM, 5G, 6 dash all of them will basically uh, share the same uh, very abstract uh, architecture that you can see here. In the case of DeathNet, um, we have published a number of RFCs already for the prime statement use case. And if you read the use case, very interesting doc, you'll find that there is a lot more that Industry 4.0 at stake here. Like I said, that can be power plants, that can be uh, automated cars, that can be uh, uh, trains, uh, factory process control, many use cases, pro audio, etc. And uh, the network architecture is very abstract and, and it applies to, to all of them. Now, the, um, the, the IETF DeathNet has also already produced a, a framework for the data plane, how the data plane will uh, procure, will, will, will provide the, the services that the DeathNet architecture uh, indicates. And it has two flavors right now. There is an IP flavor and an MPLS flavor. Now, the IP flavor as provided is version dependent. It's, it's V4 and V6. And for that reason, it only recognizes the flow based on the five, six tuple, uh, source IP, source port, destination P, destination port, uh, barrier protocol and flowable for V6 and, and uh, the, uh, the TOS bits. Uh, so so it, 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 can, it can use that and only that you don't, you cannot tag the packets, for instance, the sequence counter I was talking about earlier, that, that could tell you it's, diff it's a, another copy of the same packet. So, so basically the, the, the framework has defined uh, has very little features for IP. And really, uh, if you want with that framework to provide that net services, what you have to do is, is play MPLS over UDP and apply the MPLS data framework over IP. And that's, that's kind of very sad because uh, that pushes the DeathNet information deep into the packet and that's probably beyond the reach of uh, most existing ASICs. That's typically not what you want. What you would want and that you could do in the context of IPv6 is to provide new extension headers right after the IPv6 header, which would effectively indicate you the, the DeathNet information. Like I said, there are two forms of information. One which allows you to play redundancy to recognize copies of the same packet or of the same bits, as I said, because you could effectively fragment a packet into, say, five fragments and then using network coding, build eight codes that you would flood over the blue network, meaning that if at most three of those codes are lost, at least with any five, you can reconstruct the original packet. So that's the redundancy information. And that's used only by the upper piece of the DeathNet architecture that you can see on the, on the top right here, which is what we call the service sublayer. Service sublayer does the sequencing, packet replication, packet rendering, and encoding, decoding if we are playing network coding. Now, there is another sublayer which is responsible for the forwarding, the plane I get in, I get out. And so this is, this is the forwarding sublayer that is aware of which ports when this packet gets in, which part when this packet gets out. Uh, both the, the uh, service and uh, the, the, the uh, forwarding sublayers need to understand which flow we're talking about. And really, when I say flow, I don't really think flow. I think equal treatment, because along a certain blue path that I represented here and that we, we mostly call tracks and row and six dash. Um, along this, this blue complex graph, if you like, um, there, there, there will be uh, replication elimination for which we need to know which blue path we are talking about. And there will be forwarding uh, operation for which uh, you also need to, to know which blue path you're talking about. So the, the, the path information has to be available for both the forwarding and the service sublayer. The service sublayer may be implemented in just some nodes, but the forwarding has to be implemented by every node along the path. 
So basically, we need to have those two forms of information, one which relates to the path and really to the treatment. Maybe it's just in at that time, out at that time, to that port, to that next stop. And maybe it's also service layer with replication or elimination. But anyway, all this is a state in the node which basically uh, is associated with the path that the packet is following. And for this, guess what? Um, we could effectively leverage uh, IPv6. And in particular, uh, the, the path information that is to be used by both service and forwarding sublayer is basically to be used by every node, every node on the way. So it's a perfect use case for the hop by hop header. And as some of you might know, uh, the treatment of hop by hop header is changing compared to the art. Initially, uh, all writers had, had to observe it, and that meant that nobody dared play uh, place a hop by hop header in the packets. And so we mostly deprecated the use of hop by hop. But since RFC uh, 8200, now the routers, mostly the core routers, which we really don't care about hop by hops, they will there will be a load to ignore. But um, hop by hop can easily be used inside a limited domain. And guess what? A dead net network is a limited domain. So it makes perfect sense to effectively encode the path information in, in, the, in a header like hop by hop. If you do that, then you don't make your forwarding, your treatment decision based on the five or six topper anymore you make your forwarding decision based on the hop by hop, meaning that you can have more than one six stop or more than one end-to-end -end IP flow, which will share the same fate. And more interestingly, you can have OAM frames, which will observe and assure that the network treatment is the one that you want. Another good thing, the hop by hop header is always right after the IPv6 header, so it's completely within the first 64 bytes or something, which is what the ASIC can do, at least any ASIC can do. Uh, some, uh, that's way beyond the first 64. So this is something that you could implement on any existing box. So bottom line of what I would call classical, by classical I mean wired, so I and IoT if you like big robots of stuff. Um, for, for classical deterministic networking, what you have is scheduling and perfect timing, which will ensure that you send the packets right at the right time, that you will have reserved the right resources like bandwidth and buffers just in time to receive the packets. And uh, with an analogy to your hotel, uh, there will never be someone in your bed when you go back, at, you go back to the hotel at night because you have reserved that room for that time and maybe just for that precise time of that night, but and maybe the next night this resource will be used by somebody else. But at least you have scheduled that you will be in that bed at that night and there won't be anybody else in that bed unless you reroll it, which is another discussion entirely. Okay, um, so that's the first big aspect. Second big aspect is you can load actually with a lot higher ratio of critical flow than if you did not do those deterministic processing you can load your links, but you can even load them further, all the way to 100%, if you like, uh, with non-deterministic flows. So typically, you could go to 50 or 60% of deterministic flows on your network, and then the last 30 or something would, would be available for non-deterministic. But now, like I said, it's so very precisely scheduled and time and allocated, etc. And that, that's okay for wires, fibers, which are very stable networks and we lose a packet every 10 minus 5 or something. But it fails to address a very unstable connectivity, which is typical for wireless. Even if you dedicate your spectrum like 3GPP does, there will always be uh, um, other effects like uh, multipath uh, um, Fading, for instance, which is yourself interf in, uh, interfering with yourself, and, and the, the more power you place in your transmission, the more chances that this effectively happens. And sometimes the, your own interference is constructive, and the next second it's disruptive. And so, over time, objects may move in your final zone, uh, things will happen. So, a single path between A and B, even if it's a single up, it will, it will ultimately fail to provide you the constant deterministic availability that you're after. And so it fails to, to, to address many of the IoT use cases which are effectively wireless. As it stands, we have to provide something 
to compensate for this uh, less reliable link connectivity that we have on wireless. And because you have to configure all those flows and, and you have to react rapidly to, to any failure and through a IoT low power network, it might be, take a long time for, for a controller to actually tell uh, the devices, hey, your path has changed. We, we also fail to, to scale and address uh, IoT applications. So what have we done at the ATF? Well, it started like um, eight years ago, nine years ago, with six dish. And if you realize there is another historical perspective to be had here, uh, the real story started with what we call SDM. And, and the fact that now we can have a remote controller which can observe the network and optimize uh, the structure, in particular for traffic engineering. And guess what? The deterministic path is a traffic engineer path. Something happened at the same time is the, the improvement of, of clock synchronization over the network. The network became a very good source of clock. And if you combine the controller and the clock synchronization, now you can start defining when a packet for a particular flow will be sent at a certain period, very precisely. And that's what really enabled deterministic network. And now if you want to scale that to the scale of, of the IoT, then the controller cannot be just this big standalone box somewhere. You have to move it closer to the edge to where your network is. And that's another trend which happened, which was the mobile edge computing. And you see that the, the combination of all those trends, mobile edge computing, SDN, clock uh, synchronization, fine time measurements, et cetera, uh, all those enabled actually the capabilities to, to enable not only the industrial internet uh, for wires, but also um, what we, we, we call six-ish, which is the capability to do the same kind of services over wireless. But to obtain the same kind of, of services over wireless, we had to develop additional methods. So six-ish is a, it was mostly uh, an architecture. Six-ish was mostly uh, a group where people could uh, develop the IoT stack that the IETF is defining using Ripple, Sixlop, and etc and try to make it work over a deterministic Mac, which, which happened to be 802.15.4. So 802.15.4 is, is a low power Mac, very well dedicated to IoT. I mean, it's, six, it's the, LP, the low pan of six low pan. And it has a particular method, which is called TSTH, time slotted channel hopping. And time slotting channel hopping is um, um, the, the base of the original deterministic industrial wireless protocol for process control, so wireless heart, ASA 100, etc. So six dish was the effort to standardize at the IETF an IoT stack which would be based on that Mac that was recognized by the industry and provide IPv6 services for it. And I will, I will say more about that. But let's let's first see some perspective. As I said, there is no way to guarantee that you will get deterministic uh, operation over a single wireless link or a single wireless path, right? Because there will be fading, there will be interference, there will be moving in your friend zone, there will be stuff. So you still want to schedule like you did in wires and you pro you get the same benefits with high ratios, uh, high, um, high delivery ratios, so very good PDR, uh, high amount of critical flows using your bandwidth, and the bounded latency. And actually, scheduling will bring you additional benefits which are uh, not found in, in wire. If you compare um, uh, the TSCH that I discussed earlier, where you schedule every transmission with an hour Wi Fi, um, in TSCH, there will not be IFS. There will, be, there will not be those gaps in transmissions which are necessary for the Mac to avoid uh, uh, collisions. There won't be the exponential back off that you can see. Uh, uh, on, on Wi-Fi, that won't be blocking at layer at the layer two, layer one. So all those things that Wi-Fi has, which really kills the determinism of the transmission, uh, none of that exists if you schedule all your transmissions. And, and another big benefit is if you schedule that A to B happens at that time on that channel, then you can use this another channel for C to D. The way we, we do uh, wireless meshes today, because you can receive any packet at any time from any source, everybody has to be on the same channel. And basically the next packet on the flow will create effects like uh, hidden terminal with the next packet on the flow, which is two hops uh, later. 
So that really kills your, your, your throughput if you have to stay on the same channel. But if you schedule and you say this channel at that time between this guy and this guy, then all of a sudden you can use more than one channel in parallel and they won't interfere. And you can progress the packet over different channels. Okay, so that's another benefit that you get if you start scheduling like this. If that. Um, and now last but not least, you don't have to use the long preambles, etc. Uh, you, you, you know when to wake up to send or receive and then you can go down to sleep, meaning that you will effectively save your battery. Now, so yes, you've got the same benefits as wires, you effectively have no benefits, but the way you will achieve this will have to be different in wireless and wires. And the reason is, when you're on the wire, for instance, and, and you have this deterministic packet that you want to send on this port, and maybe you're sending a non-deterministic packet on that same port, you can interrupt, with TSN you can do that, you can interrupt the, uh, the, the, the lower pre precedence uh, flow to let your deterministic packet flow instead. That's called preemption, that's, that's BU802.1. BU802.3 BR, um, you, you can basically preempt a packet that, that, that you're sending. With wireless, since it's a shared media, the, the collision could come, the big packet could come from somebody else and you cannot tell him stop because he's transmitting and he's not capable of hearing you. So there's no way to interrupt somebody. So the only way to make sure that you will get the, the bandwidth available at the time of the deterministic packet is to schedule it. All the deterministic packets must be scheduled and all the transmitters in the network must be aware of that, that schedule so they don't effectively send at the time uh, of the deterministic packet. Now the other thing that you really want to do is ensure that you use all possible forms of diversity, path diversity, time diversity, coding diversity, um, all of the possible uh, technology diversity, all the possible forms of diversity so that if something kills your transmission maybe on Wi-Fi between those two guys, then it's, there's a good chance that that same something will not kill your 3GPP transmission between you and uh, very different guys on another direction, on another channel at another time. That's what I mean by diversity. If you want reliability and wireless, you need not only to, to, to send multiple copies, but you want to send those copies with as much diversity as you can. Uh, last but not least, um, in wireless, we can extend uh, the packet replication elimination ordering function of DeathNet because there are new stuff that exists in wireless, like HIRQ FAC, for instance, but also over hearing, I send, there can be multiple receivers. Why should there be only one guy listening to me? If there are more than one people on the direction of my flow, maybe they can all receive my packet and, and help forwarding it uh, further. And uh, last but not least, but quite difficult, there is also the possibility to have two senders and a single receiver, which is what we call constructive interference. So like I said, it all started with six stage and say we have this graph on this left, on the, on the right, we can effectively program time and frequency. So in 15.4 to 2.4 gig, we've got 16 channels and we can basically affect what we call time slots to some communications. And that's quite easy to do. You do that with your controller, you know all your flows, so you can decide when a packet of a given flow progress. And if you have a control loop at a certain period or a number of control loops at a certain period, you align this matrix to the period you want and you play it over and over. So that's kind of easy. What's, what's hard actually is once you've placed all your deterministic packets over this matrix, what's hard is to decide how you will do over the big mesh, the non-deterministic flows. And that's what 60 really did because the, the, the six local ripple packets, the flows are not deterministic. Typically, the, the packets uh, will come anytime. And so what you have to do is, is allocate the rest of the matrix for the non-deterministic flow directly, uh, dynamically. You can't say, let me put some slots for any A or any B uh, scattered because you will waste that bandwidth if there is no traffic. So you have to dynamically allocate some of those cells for the duration of the flow and once the flow is terminated, then you can release that. And that's really the, 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 the one thing that 60 is created on top of building this architecture. But like I said, the most work that we did at 60 was to ensure that the different elements that the ATF has defined, Ripple, 6 Lopan, Coap, etc., could effectively be put together. And we, we spent uh, a lot of our time as a working group actually doing interrupt tests. 
uh, under the, the umbrella of HC, actually, and usually during the IETF meetings, right after or right after before the meetings, um, we, we were doing those interrupt tests, working the, those time set allocation that CIS is defined with repo with six and etc. Mostly defining the architecture that binds everything together: six lopan repo, IPv6, um, six lopan compression, six lopan neighbor discovery. All this stack is defined, is described by the six dish architecture, and we made it work as a side effect over I2.2.15 for types of each channel hopping, for which we had to define this adaptation layer, which we call six top. And six top is the place using the scheduling function SF you see on the right. It's the place where we'll negotiate the time slot for stochastic traffic for normal IP based default traffic. So, like I said, deterministic IP over deterministic MAC, that was the easy piece. Um, Non-deterministic IP over deterministic MAC was some effort, that's six stage, but it was doable. The one thing which is undoable is to do uh, deterministic IP over non-deterministic MAC like Wi-Fi. Because even if you schedule your packets, you tag them, etc., at layer three, if at layer two and one you do blocking, if you have to wait for exponential backup, then you lose all the precise property that you want. So what we need to do now, and that's what Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7 is doing, is improve the layer two in the case of Wi-Fi, so we can we can get effectively the same capabilities and services over Wi-Fi than we can get over 5G or over TSCH. And considering that Wi-Fi is effectively taking that path, we have created the new raw, raw working group for reliable available wireless, which tries to abstract those networks, TSCH, Wi-Fi, 6, 7, 5G, 6G, and a new technology called LDAX as well, which is used for airplane control. We, we have tracked them as schedulable technologies, and we define how we could do uh, IP layer services over that. And which IP layer services can we bring? Well, for one, there is all those things I discussed about the service layer, replication, elimination, etc. This doesn't have to be layer two, it can be either layer two or layer three. And things that you can never do on a layer two, which is, for instance, decide if you want to use 5G or Wi Fi. As soon as you want to, to provide the first use case that you see on the left, which is basically um, providing highly reliable transmission over various types of interface to optimize your diversity, then you need to go layer three anyway. So that's that's the first use case where role would just configure consider the access and consider that the rest of the way of the network is kind of transparent. And the fault is quote unquote on the first half. And now say you have a phone which has a number of radios, um, then the question would be, should I copy my packet on all of those radios, meaning that I will have many, many copies and I will uh, kill my battery and, and will kill the bandwidth for the other users as well? Or should I use only a selected subset of those interfaces, in which case, which at this very precise time? And now if you extend this concept of, of saying, hey, uh, I have to, to, to look at my network and consider what, which of the network resources I need to use at this particular time, if you if you look at a, a big mesh network like a big ripple network on the right, and so say this is a, a smart grid network with thousands of nodes, and we really build those networks with six low panel ripple. Um, say now that you want to do some automation loop, like this little graph that you can see, it's a small geodag between node A and node H, and you want to build that small geodag using, for instance, route projection in ripple, the new the new RFCs which are coming from the raw working group. So, say you want to do that, but uh, you have to cope with links which are unstable, for instance, D2F or C2E, right? Um, so how can you make that work to ensure that you still get um, at least one copy at every packet and never lose more than one or two packets in a row? So that's basically the, the, <clears throat> the raw problem. So for one thing, we've defined the terms, right? Because when you, when you work on something, uh, you have to define the terms. Keep in mind that one thing, reliability um, is, is basically uh, expressed as a, a statistical value, which can be a mean time between failure, but usually in our networks, that's not what we want. What we really care about is the maximum consecutive, consecutive failure. And remember, a failure doesn't mean uh, the packet was not distributed. It means it was not distributed in time. If you delay your packet too much, it is a failure. 
You can't have more than two or three or four failures, otherwise your system will go in fail safe. Otherwise, there might be lives at stake. So maximum consecutive failure is a very important statistical me uh, measurement that, that you want to ensure. And the variability is the other big one, which is really a ratio of uptime and downtime. Obviously, you want to ensure that the uptime is maximized. And finally, uh, Rho will, will define these pareo terms, which is, like I said earlier, an extension to the pre-off terms. Now, if we look at the prime, the prime is we still have the same architecture as before, but we have this controller somewhere above the Ripple network. And we have the very huge uh, uh, Ripple network, and the, the, the communication between the controller and, and the Ripple nodes down there can take seconds. It's very slow. Now, the, the time uh, a link will flap on the wireless uh, could be the time that something passes in the friendly zone and goes. It could be a split second. So you can't go to the controller to fix your path uh, if that is slower than the time of the breakage. What you really want is configure this little graph, which we call a track, with enough redundancy so that at all times there will always be enough uh, chances for the packet to pass through. That means that you have a lot more than two parallel paths. You have a lot of replication and emulation inside, and probably um, you see uh, the upper path blue, uh, uh, red, sorry, and the lower path blue here, which are the main path, that are joined by uh, north uh, south links. Well, maybe two is just not enough. Maybe there is three, four, five. But then, if, if with three, four, five that you flood all the time, you can guarantee that you will always, always, always get your copies of the packet. At the same time, you realize that that will kill your battery and that will kill your spectrum. And those two are very critical resources. So you can't go ahead and go back to the controller to, to fix the, the path. But at the same time, you can't have too much uh, redundancy in the network. Uh, otherwise, you will kill your, your uh, resources, your, your uh, spectrum and, and, and uh, batteries. So how do you, do you solve this? And that's basically the, the row, uh, the row problem. So row is splitting the function that we know as PC, which is the centralized computer, uh, far, far away from the small devices in the mesh, um, and will will take away a, a forwarding pass function, which will be to make the decision of using only a subset of that redundancy based on the instant capabilities of the network at this very time. So if some links are flapping then uh, we'll use the paths that don't use these links. And for that, you will need to observe the link and, and basically use metrics which are up, down. Very instant, very Boolean metrics and, and very short uh, duration values compared to what the PC sees. And the PC up there looks at the network from the perspective of hours or days. It uses metrics like statistics of, of your links, which are over long times. So everything is expressed as a shade of gray compared to the instant value that the PSC will be using. So basically, PC centralized far, far away will do the routing, and by routing we mean designing a small overlay between your entry, your ingress and your egress. The small overlay that you could flood to guarantee your high reliability between A and B. But if you flood it that way, then you're wasting bandwidth, spectrum, and you're wasting energy. So the PC will be, the PSC, I'm sorry, will be local to this little graph inside the network and in charge of observing that little graph only at a very fast pace and deciding what subset of it is going to be used. That's, that's the thing that Rho is doing. And for that, we are considering what we call a OODA loop. So OODA stands for observe, and that's really having sending OAM packets over this little graph to see what works, what works not. Orient, which is what the PC will really do, right? The PC will not only build this graph, but it, also, it will also pre-build the number of subgraphs that the PSC can take depending on what breakage it observes. So basically, the, the PC can predict the number of possible breakages and tell the PSC if you observe um, through OAM, if, if you see that there is this breakage, let me orient you to the path that you should be using. And then the PSC will effectively decide this new forwarding plane component will decide where to forward the packet. As opposed to the full graph flooding, it will be sending only on a, su on a subset of that. And then it will signal that in the packets so that all the hops on the way can take the action, which is the A of the UTA model. Now, if we put 
all this together, we realize that Rho is mostly an extension of DevNet. We are still doing traffic engineering, but we are considering it in the case of radios, where links will flap for a very short time, where we need to observe those links and use the ones that work to save bandwidth spectrum energy. And so we need this, we need to, to extend the forwarding plane with this new function that is inside the nodes, inside the little graph that, that we flood uh, for our control loop and, and that we call a PSC. So a PSC is really an extension that, that is not needed, does not exist in that net. That net will do the, the copy replication elimination in a hard way for every packet. Here we'll do it intelligently because we provide a lot more redundancies, but we don't want to use it all. Now, Rho will observe to do that with OAM every hop, and uh, we can use techniques from um, the, the uh, Mane working group like uh, DLIP protocol to observe one hops. And then we will capture all of the values along the path, for instance, by sending an OAM back from the, the uh, egress back to the ingress and gathering all the data. And we can also observe the layer three end to end. So ingress sends this at this time, what does egress receive? And by, by observing that in a, in a permanent loop, UDA loop, then we can effectively tune the use of the wireless resources for our needs. And with this, I'm done. And if we have any question, then uh, I'm ready to take them. I don't know how we'll do that, Melini, but that's basically uh, my talk. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm um, sure. So, so no, this is wonderful, Pascal. Um, and I have a few questions. But let me take the questions from the audience first. Um, so first, um, this is back to your hop by hop header question um, uh -huh. uh, or slot is how is looping prevented with hop by hop? How is what prevented? Sorry, looping, looping, and um, I can I you know uh, you know what what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute the gentleman who asked it. Um, so Andre, if you want to explain some more, I've unmuted you, if you want to explain your question. I'm listening. Yeah. Uh, Andre? He's, he's muted. Um, okay, well, let me, while he's, while he's unmuting, let me ask some questions. So, so do I? Well, okay, so maybe, maybe I can answer a little bit that question anyway. So, so the graph that we're talking about is typically a direct acyclic graph. And that is installed by the controller. So the controller knows that it's been installed and it will activate it when it's installed, when it's happy that it's installed. Now, the, the packets will be tagged with um, this hub by header with kind of the name of that, that graph. And so when you follow the graph, you have no choice, but it's a directly acyclic graph. So you have no choice, but following the graph from source to destination. And so by, by construction, this graph will not be loss, uh, will, will be lossless. So that's what we do at Roll actually. When we, we do this DAO projection draft, it's always a geodag, just like in normal repo. It's just an overlay repo over the normal repo for this local little graph. For the more generic uh, row, you must have some tagging in the packets to know which, uh, hops have already been traversed so as to never traverse them again and we have an example of that using beer so basically if you use beer te and there is a draft with my name at beer if you if you look for it um, you will find that when you send a packet over a hop then there is there is effectively one bit in a bitmap which is associated to that transmission that packet over that hop and when you send over the hop you have to clear the bit and once the bit is clear, the packet cannot be sent over that hop again. And that's another way using BRTE to ensure that you will never loop. So it's just two, two ways. So you, in your hop by hop, you could put BRTE, or you could use just a path information if you have a, a, a direct acyclic graph to follow. So that's, that's two ways of doing that. I hope it helps. Yes. Sure, sure. And um, um, certainly, I, uh, if, if the person would like to ask more questions, I can, I can uh, uh, send those over to you. So, so one, uh, uh, I have a couple of fundamental questions. So when you're, when you're talking about six tish and so on, so what I'm hearing you say is all these things I see are built on IPv6. So you wouldn't be able to do things like what six tish does 
with IPv4, um, since you're also taking advantage of hop by hop. Am I am I getting that? Am I understanding this, this what you're saying? Correct. If, if actually a critical component of the whole architecture is Ripple, the routing protocol, and Ripple builds what we call instances. So it, it will uh, each instance is like a verb uh, in normal routing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a virtual it's it's a routing table. So you can run multiple Ripple instances on the same network already uh, by design since inception of Ripple. And that's because, for instance, you have some sensors in your home that will send data to the cloud via your home gateway. But there might be also some other sensors or some electrical devices, the devices that you want to connect to your uh, electrical appliance, uh, electrical input of your home, on which there can also be uh, IP using six lopan and wise and all those things you could also connect ip uh to, to your electrical meter and back to the cloud so the, uh, the electrical cloud so they could control your washing machine now so you want to have multiple networks like this with different tunings if you like and for that and, and by the way you want to use the same nodes as relays so a router can can send packets over one in ripple instance to the normal internet from gateway to the cloud and some other packets the same routers but uh, other packets are going to the electrical meter to be sent back to the electrical infrastructure to enable the packets in for both types of flows you you need two different routing tables two different ripple instances so ripple built in has this concept of instance which allows basic multi-homing without doing source destination but that's the same service as source destination you can do multi-home and so to do that, Ripple uses effectively a hop by hop. And not only to do that, but also to avoid loops, etc. That's part of what you do with the Ripple hop by hop header. Now, Sixtish inheriting from, from Ripple, Sixtish already has this hop by hop. So Sixtish was fine. What is not fine is DeathNet. DeathNet doesn't have it. And so the way DeathNet uh, data plane works for IP today, if you want to provide a service layer you, for which you need a sequence counter, then you need to place the sequence counter over UDP. Uh, basically, the model is since we have something for MPLS, let's do MPLS over UDP and then let's use the MPLS data plane over UDP over IP, which, like I said, is a very complex structure and pushes the data possibly beyond the capabilities, uh, the reach of, of the ASX. So, I see. The, okay. Up is there in six stage? We want to have the same concept apply to that net in general yes no very very interesting i have i have to read some more um and uh, if anybody else has questions please go ahead and, and ask otherwise i have one more um and so so I, I did again did i get you right that you're sending duplicate packets to ensure that they get that you know that something gets through um and yeah. if that's what you're doing um, I mean, TCP is not going to be happy about that. So no, TCP um, is not yeah. happy with what we're doing, and and we are not using MPTCP, by the way. We we are. <clears throat> so the whole idea is that um, the, the the simple idea of this is you build a graph like a directly acyclic graph between A and B, and along that graph there can be a replication where you send a copy of the packet on two paths, uh, on two next stops, if you like, along this graph. You may see that as building an overlay and flooding it. You know, the, the flooding broadcast, like you copy on every link, but the one you got it from. Um, yeah. so plain flooding without even any routing. If you have a way to flood once, not only once your network, then you could figure that by building an overlay and flooding it, there's high reliability. The more, uh, the bigger your, your overlay, the more links there is in it, the highest chances that you'll get copies. But that you, you'll get effectively too many copies in the end if this network has a lot of opportunities to copy. And, and so when you exceed the network, there is this uh, elimination function which can happen inside or at the end of the network or both, where you will eliminate the extra copies and just provide one to the upper layer. Now some upper layers may accept that the packets are disordered because you know if you lose a packet on the, on the fast path, then you have to wait for that copy on the slow path, on the slower of the possible path. Um, but then packets on the fast path may, uh, with a higher sequence, may already have crossed the network, which means that you may have um, changed the order of the packet. And so you're in a situation where 
you might effectively, for some flows, have to reorder them before you deliver. And that's that's the O in pre-op. No, very interesting. So your applications, I, I think, may need to be more intelligent too. So, you know, one thing that would be very interesting, and and thank you so much for all your time, is um, um, I'd love to take a look at some packet traces from all this. And I think in the upcoming uh, webinars and so on, um, uh, there the or the and the MOOC, there will be a chance to take packet traces. So I'm like, because. It's it's just it's uh, it's much easier for me to understand if I can see the packet flows. So, but yeah, but, for repo um, they exist. For six dish they exist. We have a dissector and everything. Uh, for row, it's it's work in progress. So we have not for row and net net the hop by hop are just a proposal. I mean the working group has not adopted the hop by hop proposal. But I hope that you guys, I mean, if you contribute to that net understand why I'm proposing this and, and you help me make it a reality. Otherwise, IP will be the same for V4 and V6 and it's going to be MPLS over UDP, which is, I mean, it hurts me. No, no, I will definitely contact you offline because we ourselves are doing a great deal of studies with uh, IPv6 extension handlers and some studies and stuff, and in fact, encryption. And so I will, this is very, very interesting for me, and I'll contact you offline and see if, if we can work together on some of this. Um, so this you is know just wonderful. <laughs> so, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, Pascal, and we will continue next time with all this wonderful IoT stuff. Thank you all for attending, and um, we will be sending um, uh, the recording out. So, yes, thanks again, uh, Pascal.